I'm going to welcome everybody to the California Historical Society. My name is Patricia Fort, and I manage public programs here, as well as visitor services. So anybody at the front desk or anybody working and volunteering at this program are some of the many amazing staff members that you'll see this evening. And I always like to thank them. Usually they're around, but we've got our volunteers in the back if you want to wave. Our wonderful volunteers who helped set up the chairs today, always helpful. Yay, chairs! Without chairs, what would we do? Don't know. It's the lifeblood of a program, let me tell you that much. Um, so, you know, the first thing that I like to do, and I'll introduce Katie, is acknowledge the land that we all sit and stand and experience this program in, which is Ramatashaloni land. And actually, when you, um, the essential name of the Loni Ramatish land um, is Yalamu. That's the traditional name for the landscape for the people who live on this land. So I always like to give a second to think about the fact that we have the privilege and the honor to be on this land that was uh, taken. So I like to take a moment just to think about that. And then I love to transition into the question of who's been here before. If you want to raise your hand, like who's been to CHS? Okay, there we go, a few people in the audience. It's always a hard transition from those two things. Um, welcome back to anybody who's been here before and welcome to everybody who's new to us. Um, we are always excited to see new faces and people who will probe what we do and experience what we do in the variety of ways that we do it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions and comments after the program. If you have ideas for us, we're always open and willing to hear them. And this is really the beginning of many, many more programs that we'll do on LGBTQ plus histories in California. What we did is that we identified a major gap in our programming. And we weren't doing well, we weren't doing right. So. Um, this is really the beginning of a start of, I think, a wonderful exploration for us, and I'm just really glad and honored that you're here. And one of the reasons why we're doing all this work is uh, Katie, the executive director of the Tenderloin Museum, was kind enough to introduce us to Susan for this program. I had read Susan's book, and I absolutely loved it, and was blown away, and realized how important California is to the civil rights for, for trans people, and so, um, Intersecting all those things together is the amazing Tenderloin Museum and all the powerful work that they do. They're a wonderful community museum. I think they do some of the most phenomenal programming in the city. I mean, I'm sure people might contest me on that, but I'll fight it to the end. So, um, and Katie's been a great partner for us for so, so long. So I'm actually gonna hand the mic to her so she can tell a little bit about the amazing programming they do. So you can go to their museum, see their programs, and, and learn the amazing history of the Tenderloin neighborhood and the surrounding history, so. Come up, Katie. Thanks so much, Patty. Um, well, in the grand tradition of those who do public programming, how many of you have been to the Tenderloin Museum before? All right, so quite a few. Um, we're very proud to be longtime collaborators of both the California Historical Society and Susan Strikers. She was a collaborator of ours and an official advisor on the museum even before we opened. She advised on our transgender history in the Tenderloin exhibits. Um, which is a history that we're really proud to showcase in our permanent collection. Uh, she was also an official advisor on our play, The Compton's Cafeteria Riot, which opened last year. Here's some photos. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. And we're hoping to restage it um, at the end of this year as well. Um, one of the authors of the play will be in attendance later for this um, program, Donna Persona. Um, she actually has an art show opening up at the Tenderloin Museum this Thursday. You may have gotten one of these flyers on your seat, and if not, there's some more up at the front. Um, the Donna Persona Portraits Project uses photography and portraiture as sites for exploring transgender and gender nonconforming identity, um, and it aims to showcase the wide spectrum of the transgender experience. Donna is actually the Grand Marshal of Pride this year as well, um, so we're really proud of that and her as well. Um, we have a lot of programming coming up this month um, related to LGBTQ plus history, including a walking tour with Shane Watson, who's an LGBT architectural historian on June 20th. Then we have a drag queen bingo event to raise money for our upcoming Aunt Charlie's exhibition project. Um, how many of you have been to Aunt Charlie's before? 
Excellent. So it's a really thriving working class drag bar in the Tenderloin and the last um, LGBTQ bar in the neighborhood. And we're going to be doing six months of art shows and programming um, about Aunt Charlie's as well as creating a book. And Susan Stryker is actually an official advisor on that book as well. And we're going to be welcoming her, welcoming her to the museum on July 18th. Uh, for an event screening of Forever is going to start tonight, which is about legendary drag performer Vicky Marlene, who also performed at Aunt Charlie's. And then we're also screening Susan's seminal film, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria on August 8th. So that's a lot of details, but uh, there's flyers and the information is on our website and Facebook as well. So thanks so much for coming, and I'll turn it over back to Patty. Back. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. So you may be wondering, what is California Historical Society? Where the heck are you? Um, I can answer a little bit of that. So our mission, we started in 1871, and our mission is to, um, to celebrate and share California's history and make it a part of your contemporary life. So when Susan is presenting on her powerful book on transgender history and California, you'll see and experience how that history might relate to your current experience or the current experience of those you may care about or see in your everyday life, and that's us fulfilling our mission. So um, that's one of the many ways that we do that. We do it with our exhibitions, which you are sitting in the middle of one of them. Um, all our program spaces are our exhibition spaces, so oftentimes they're quite immersive and quite cozy. So we have two exhibitions right now about the Transcontinental Railroad. It's celebrating its 150th anniversary. And so we talk about women and their roles in and on the railroads. We talk about Chinese exclusion. Um, from the country and from the state, as well as their, um, their uh, use and their bodies that were used for, to build the railroads, so those contradictions that are kind of key to the building of the railroads. And we talk about kind of the advertising and the propaganda around the celebration of the railroads when they began. So those are all a component of what we do. And actually on your chairs, you have little uh, pamphlets from our collections, and that's actually part of our rich archives. We have millions and millions of different items from ephemera manuscripts, maps, costumes, letters from the gold rush, street photography of San Francisco, Carlton Watkins, Edward Boybridge, so many amazing collection items. And they're all for you to view and use Wednesday through Friday for free, 1 to 5 p.m. So please come back, look at our uh, amazing collections, everything from the ACLU and their civil liberties cases to People's Temple and we're the repository for the People's Temple collection. So there's amazing research to be done and we are always excited for new researchers and new writing because that gets history out there. People get to experience it and that's really, really important. And of course we do public programs. This is one of the 60 events that we do every year, not just in this space but across the state. So we always invite you to come back for more. Next Tuesday, we'll be showing the documentary on Miss Major, a really amazing and powerful and influential black trans activist um, who lived much of her life across the country and lived part of it here in, in Oakland in the Bay. And then we close out the series of programs um, with Mark Stein talking about his book and California Before Stonewall. So a great set of programs just around uh, these LGBTQ plus California histories, but about um, the diverse array of histories that touch all of us in California. And of course, all of that work, including my salary, is because of all of you. When you bought a ticket tonight, you helped CHS. When you buy a book tonight, you're helping CHS. When you become a member or renew, you're helping us do all the work that we do, from supporting our speakers, to keeping the lights on, to preserving our amazing collections. All of that is done by the small and large donations that everyone um, gives to us. Um, on a daily, weekly, yearly basis, so we we're very, very grateful for that. Um, and of course, if you're a member tonight or become a member, you get 20% off your book, so something to think about. Um, and you get to come to these programs uh, for free um, every time you come, so usually a, a good benefit of all. And then I'm going to finish with the most exciting part, which is housekeeping, and then close with Susan and my intro for her. So you've got evaluations on your seats. Please finish them and uh, send them over to the front desk when you're done. You've got paper cups and plates. Please recycle and compost those. And when we do the audience Q&A, which we hold to the end, just make sure you raise your hand and somebody will come to uh, provide you a mic. And of course, we leave questions for the mic and then comments for the post Q&A portion for the book signing. So if you've got an amazing story to tell, hold that to your chest. Put it in your pocket. 
and leave it for the amazing conversations you'll have with each other and with Susan post-audience Q&A. But if you've got an amazing question, keep that in your pocket as well and say it during the audience Q&A. And again, there'll be roving mics for that. So the best part of my job is introducing the amazing, amazing speakers we have here at CHS. I'm constantly blown away by the talent that we get to have in our spaces on a weekly basis. And I told Susan that I really nerded out when she came through because I absolutely love, love this book. It's short, it's concise, it's powerful, it's informative. I'm probably selling it to you right now, but it is really that good. Um, so I'm really honored to introduce her. Susan Stryker is an award-winning scholar and filmmaker whose historical research, theoretical writing, and creative works have helped shape the cultural conversations on transgender topics since the 1990s. She earned her PhD in, in US history at UC Berkeley and later held a Ford Foundation Social Research Council postdoctoral fellowship in sexual studies at Stanford and has been a distinguished visiting professor at Harvard University, Yale, Northwestern, John Hopkins, UC Santa Cruz, Macri University in Sydney, in Vancouver, she has written amazing books, including the one she'll be talking about tonight, Gay by the Bay, A History of Queer Culture in San Francisco and the Bay Area, Queer Pulp, A Perverse Fashions in the Golden Age of the Paperback, The Transgender Studies History Reader, which was Rutledge 2006, and then The Trans History, Transgender History, Roots of Today's Revolution, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight and from which we have for sale. I'm really excited to get started, so I'm gonna hand it back to Susan so she can start presenting. And as again, you have your questions, leave them for the Q&A. And thank you all for being here. We're so happy to have you. And let's give a round for Susan to start. Well, hello. Thank you all for coming out. Is my mic on? You can hear me. We're all good? Great. Um, thanks, Patty, for the introduction. And Katie, saying nice things. You know, I love working with you know, the Tenderloin Museum and, and the California Historical Society. And thank you all for coming out tonight. I mean, the weather's so nice. It's like, let's kind of maybe enjoy the air conditioning for a little bit, but then like kind of get back out and enjoy the unseasonably uh, warm um, uh, San Francisco air. Um, I have a lot of ground to cover in about 45 minutes, so let's get started. Much of what I have to share tonight is drawn from this book, um, Transgender History, The Roots of Today's Revolution. This is a revised second edition of a book that was originally commissioned long ago in 2008 um, by Brooke Warner, who was this really amazing editor at the East Bay-based publisher Seal Press, which is a kind of a grassroots feminist press that has since been absorbed by a you know, big publishing conglomerate. Um, but uh, this book was originally written as a part of a series of introductory textbooks on current issues and feminisms. Um, but all that's kind of a long-winded way of saying that this is a book with deep Bay Area ties. And while the broader narrative I'm going to focus on tonight uh, is a, a national one, uh, I've done my best to try to focus on anecdotes and images drawn from the Bay Area's own rich transgender history. Um, before launching into the narrative, you know, historians have this bad habit of saying, like, I'm going to tell you this story. Before I can tell you that story, I have to tell you this other thing. And then another thing before that. So the thing that I have to tell you first is that I just really want to acknowledge how much of my presentation tonight um, focuses on a very narrow part of trans history that um, given the historical sources that I found to date that focus mostly on San Francisco, a lot of that history is of white trans people, and a lot of those white trans people are trans feminine people, people who were assigned male at birth, but you know, changed over the course of their life. Um, and I just really want to acknowledge that trans history is so much broader than that, uh, filled with trans masculine people and non-binary people, as well as people of color, and that I, you know, I feel like I come up short tonight and the task of really adequately representing the, the diversity of trans experience. Um, um, I also want to say a word or two about the motivations. Uh, why do I do the research and writing that I do? And I say the most important motivation really is simply to contest the misconception that trans people are some sort of like newfangled thing invented by the cultural left just to annoy conservatives. You know, <laughs> that it's like we, we've been around. Uh, as you will see, if you are not already woke to it, you know, gender diverse people have been around for a long time, probably for as long as there have been people. 
Um, uh, the word transgender itself is new. It only dates back to the 1960s, um, so like only 50-ish years old. Um, a lot of the medical procedures that trans people use, you know, if they want sort of medical assistance for doing their gender transitions, like the surgery and hormones, they're only about, you know, 100 years old at this point. Um, uh, but that what the word transgender is meant to describe is really a truly ancient and ubiquitous dimension of, of human culture. Um, so documenting and telling stories about how people who cross over the socially imposed gender boundaries associated with their assigned sex at birth, documenting how they've existed for a long time, is one way that I, as an historian, try to contribute to the social justice work that um, the contemporary condition of transgender issues, I think, demands of us. Um, precisely because some people assume that our existence as trans people uh, is actually impossible. It's like, you can't be a dude if you don't have that junk down there. It's like, it's impossible. It's like you're arguing with nature. Of, it's just a fact, you know, who you are and what you are. Um, and that, you know, I call that um, uh, ontological violence, you know, and ontology is a, you know, fancy word, you know, from the field of philosophy that's um, concerned with the nature of being and reality. And that, you know, I think mainstream society often practices violence against trans people by saying it's impossible that you exist. It's ontologically impossible. Um, and I've put up this sort of famous photo of the trans actor Laverne Cox on the cover of Time Magazine from 2014, just because I think it's a nice picture. But what I want to draw your attention to is an op-ed piece that Laverne Cox wrote a year earlier, and which wasn't as nicely illustrated, um, in the New York Times, where she spoke out about this very issue that I've been calling ontological violence. Cox wrote, quote, um, at the heart of the fight for trans justice, is a level of stigma so intense, so pervasive, that trans folks are often told we simply don't exist, that we're really just the gender we were assigned at birth. Paradoxically, she suggests, the violence directed at trans people is at some level intended to make not exist that which the perpetrator of that violence believes should not exist, but which seemingly does exist and which therefore must be destroyed so that it won't actually exist. So violence against trans people is thus, for some people, an act of erasure that attempts to restore the proper order of the cosmos. And part of what I hope to demonstrate and explain through my historical work is just the fundamental fact that trans existence is actually possible and actually real. I mean, here I am and here we are, right? It's like, it's real. Um, we're doing it, right? Uh, believe in it, I've seen it. You know, um, historical scholarship uh, can also document what the legal scholar Dean Spade in his book Normal Life up here uh, calls administrative violence, um, by which he means how the categories of personhood that society operates through, like, you know, man and woman, citizen, immigrant, um, how the categories that society operates through uh, can actually produce harm to people who don't easily fit into those categories. Uh, sex segregated public toilets are a great example of how society can be organized in ways that uh, result in violence or suffering for people whose bodies or identities don't comply with or conform to social gender norms. So if you don't adhere seamlessly to your society's beliefs about what your body means, it can be difficult to perform a basic bodily function like um, urinating or defecating. Um, and so again, part of what I do as a historian is to show how society's oppressive administrative structures and strategies are not actually carved in stone, that there's nothing natural about most of them, that they have in fact developed over time and they're changeable. Um, and I think that because that we can show how things were in fact different in the past than they are now, we can empirically document that because we know the past is different from the present, it kind of helps us imagine that the future can be different from the present too. You know, so I really think of historical work as not you know, dwelling in the past just for the sake of nostalgia, but thinking critically about the past as a way of imagining 
how the future can be different from the present moment. Um, public toilets um, actually offer a perfect illustration of this idea. You know, given the current moral panic over transgender people using public toilets that match our gender identity and expression rather than the sex assigned at birth, um, you'd think that multi-user, single-gender public toilets were a fact of nature um, that had existed, existed since the dawn of time and that trans people trying to publicly pee in peace were somehow violating some fundamental law. But in fact, um, the first commercial building in the United States to have indoor flush toilets, the Tremont House Hotel in Boston, which opened in 1829. Um, it did have gender segregation, but it segregated men and women in the dining rooms and parlors. There was a men's parlor and a women's parlor and a men's you know, dining room and a women's dining room because, well, you know, it wasn't decorous you know, for you know, single unattached ladies to be socializing publicly with men, but the toilets, not so much. The toilets, um, <laughs> the toilets, if you can see in that little schematic diagram up there, the two pinkish things on the left are the ladies' parlor and dining room, and the blue on the right are the men's dining room and parlors. And that little red square was the toilet area off the main circulation space of the hotel. Uh, there was a row of um, water closets with doors you know, for single-user toilets, and you went in, you did your business, you came back out, and there was a common washing up area. There's just a row of sinks on the other side of the room. Nobody freaked out about it. It's like this was considered, you know, like modern, modern science, you know, ooh, indoor flush toilets, and they just didn't care so much about the gender segregation there. Um, I also included a picture of this like really cool kind of steampunk 19th century toilet. <laughs> Um, because, um, you know, one of the complaints today about it's like, oh, I don't want to have, you know, multi-gender mixed use public toilets because uh, people who are like, let's just call them standing urinators often um, <laughs> might have poor aim uh, and they leave the seat wet for the rest of us. Um, so what this, this toilet did, it's like, it was like a theater seat, you know, it's like the default position on the seat is up, you know, it was spring loaded and then you went in and if you wanted to sit rather than stand, you just use that handy little handle on the side and pulled the seat down and did your business and when it was done, it pops back up and it's a no-brainer. So anyway, which just proves there is no such thing as, as progress. Um, <laughs> um, all right, um, uh, I do want to get started with the more sort of narrative part of the presentation today to kind of, sort of to get on with our stories. Uh, when European colonizers first came to North America, um, one of the very first things that they noticed was that indigenous people thought about sexuality and gender really differently than people from, from Europe did. Um, in the very first narrative written by a European person describing the parts of North America that are now the United States. It was this guy, uh, a great name, if you don't know him, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, which means like head of a cow. Um, um, he was writing in 1537, a long time ago. He had horrible luck. It's like he and a bunch of other people had tried to colonize Florida. It didn't work. The people who already lived there you know, kind of drove them out. Um, their ships got caught in a hurricane in the Gulf, crashed, you know, shipwrecks. Um, Cabeza de Vaca and three other people are on like floating on broken pieces of the ship and wash ashore on a um, place they called uh, Isla de Malado, the island of misfortune. He's like right, it seems like it was a sand spit right next to Galveston Island. And they wash ashore, and the people who live there kind of come up and are saying, like, you know, hey, need some help. And um, what Nunez, um, uh, what, what Cabeza de Vaca first noticed about them, he says, quote, I saw a piece of devilry, namely, a man married to another man. These are effeminate, impotent men. In Spanish, it was hombres amarianados impotentes. It's like these are effeminate, impotent men, and they go about covered up like women, and they do the work of women. Um, most native cultures in North America seem to have recognized multiple genders. 
but the colonizers recognized only two, uh, and that uh, they thought people who, in their opinion, cross-dressed were, were uh, engaging in sodomy, uh, that it was just a, it was about homosexuality, um, um, and that part of the settlement and colonization process was to, part of the, the violence of it, was to uh, attempt to destroy native gender systems and to shoehorn indigenous people into categories of European origin, just like converting their religion, it was like converting their genders. And uh, there's actually an indigenous scholar named um, uh, Deborah Miranda, who's like coined the term gender side. She said like what happened to native people was gender side. Um, um, these efforts were not entirely successful, you know, because there are many native people alive today who consider themselves to be two-spirit. Um, uh, it's important to note that two-spirit is not synonymous with transgender. It's like it's a word that is for people of indigenous ancestry to use for themselves and it is not for other people. Um, but that um, you know, it's, it's a word that gets used by two-spirit people today to like reclaim the legacy that they feel was lost in many of their cultures as a result of colonization. And some two-spirit people also think of themselves as transgender or as gay, but it's not a, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one fit. Um, all right, and I tried to find pictures of two-spirit people in California. I searched and searched, I could not find any historic pictures. I found a current picture of Bay Area American Indian Two-Spirit contingent in a recent Pride Parade. Um, but uh, for a historical picture, I used this photo of Ash Tish, uh, who um, was a, a really famous uh, Lakota Sioux Two-Spirit person who's been written about quite a bit. And a lot of, a lot of uh, trans feminine Two-Spirit people uh, had male partners, but one of the things that's interesting about Ashtish is that she had a female partner. So maybe, maybe it's like the indigenous equivalent of a trans lesbian, you know, hard, hard to say. Um, just a couple of quotes um, from California um, uh, about two-spirit history here. Um, Mission Father Don Pedro Fages uh, encountered people in 1769 whom he disdainfully called Hoyas or Jewels, um, uh, very sarcastic. Um, he described them as, quote, those Indian men who both here and farther inland observed in the dress, clothing, and character of women, there being two or three such in each village, passes sodomites by profession at being confirmed that all these Indians are much addicted to this abominable vice and permit the heathen to practice the execrable, unnatural abuse of their bodies. Um, slightly more, or slightly less hostile, more accepting, uh, Father Francisco Palau um, writing from Mission Santa Clara, just down in the South Bay, uh, around 1780. He wrote, the father missionaries of the mission noticed that among the women who always worked separately and without mixing with the men, uh, there was one who by dress, which was decorously worn and by the heathen headdress and ornaments displayed, as well as the manner of working, sitting, etc., had all the appearances of a woman but judging by the face and the absence of breasts, though old enough for that, concluded that he must be a man. So they asked some of the converts, they said that it was a man, uh, but that he passed himself always for a woman and always went with them and not with the men. Um, I just want to acknowledge too that you know, there's a Spanish and Mexican history uh, in California, as well as an indigenous history for about 200 years. Uh, and that I have not to this day been able to find any documentation of a transgender presence among the Spanish society. I mean, there's documentation of indigenous two-spirit people in California, but I have not found any instances of transgender expression among the Spanish colonial society and Mexican society in California. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not there. It's just I don't read Spanish. It's like people who've written on it, translated it into English. It's like it hasn't been there. So if you're looking for a great dissertation topic, um, it's like do Sp Spanish and Mexican California trans history. It's like there's gonna be something there. Um, but by the time we get to the gold rush, um, cross-dressing, you know, it's hard to say what people's identities are, but the practice of cross-dressing was incredibly common 
incredibly common in Gold Rush, California. Um, whether it was people who were female who worked as men because they couldn't get good jobs as women or they thought they'd be safer in public if people thought they were men or whether it's like because most of the people who came out for the gold rush were male, um, there were effeminate men who like would play the women's roles in making, you know, making homes or dancing the women's part in square dances or what, whatever. There was just a lot of cross-gender expression. Uh, the two images that I put up here, uh, uh, it's like that cross-dressing was so common that one of the most popular souvenirs that 49ers would buy to take home with them to wherever they you know, came from before they came to California, they bought this picture, it was called the Girl Miner. And it was like, it was one of like those, those things they would want to tell the folks back home. It's like, I went out to California to dig me some gold. And it's like, you would not believe, but it's just like the place is just crawling with like females who dress as men. It's like, look, here's a picture. Um, and it turned out it was this guy named John Colton, who was a, you know, I think a, you know, kind of pretty, you know, young man who was walking down Market Street and saw people selling pictures of him, calling it the girl miner. And he's like, what's up with that, you know? Um, he wanted to, wanted to cut, you know, a little piece of the action. Um, but I just think it's so evocative of the kind of gender ambiguity that was just so common in the gold rush. It's like, it's a boy dressed like a boy who looks like a girl who's supposed to be a girl dressed like a boy and people liked it. It's like they thought it was hot and interesting. Um, the other um, picture up here is of Charlie Parkhurst. Um, um, and I, I put a picture of Charlie up here, I mean, one, because he was one of the better known people in sort of Anglo California in the, the late 19th century, was a famous stagecoach driver, was, you know, very quick and reliable and supposedly good with a gun and could, you know, fight off those desperados who were trying to steal the gold from the Wells Fargo stagecoach. Um, and when he died in the 1870s, um, lo and behold, it turned out he had female anatomy. And so in the obituaries at the time, it's like the newspapers used the pronoun he, you know, Charlie Parkhurst, it turned out he was a woman. You know, just like that, that the pronoun use that people defaulted to was he. But in later generations, it has seemed like people want to recover Charlie Parkhurst as a woman as a female it's like there's a mural on the side of the post office in Soquel you know that's like you know Charlie Parker's first woman to vote for president you know uh, because you know Charlie lived as a man and he was a you know upstanding citizen he wanted to vote and do his civic duty so he voted um, but if he were a woman he would not have been able to vote because that was before women had suffrage so anyway, there's all kinds of efforts to try to reclaim Park as a pioneer, uh, pioneer woman in California. And I actually think this is really misguided. Um, I mean, it's a complicated question as to how somebody identifies. It's like, well, were they female dressing as a man for work? Did they really think of themselves as a male? Like, what was the story? And if without, without Charlie, saying clearly and definitively, this is who I think I am and this is what I am and these are my pronouns. You know, just like, um, without that, we kind of have to make some inferences. And what I would say is like, this is somebody we know biographically. Um, Parkhurst had been orphaned, was raised in an orphanage at around age 10. He ran away from the orphanage, was dressing as a boy, is adopted by somebody who raises him as a boy. He like learns, you know, traditionally masculine, work, he like worked with horses um, as a teenager. He comes as a man to California. He works as a man, as an adult. He never says in his old age, it's like, ha ha ha, look what I got away with. I'm really a woman and I lived as a man. He just like lived his life and it was only at death, you know, that other people was like, oh, you know, this is a female body. And it's like, that's never anything Parkhurst put out into the world. And so it's like, I feel pretty comfortable in saying like, mm, I read how he lived and I'm pretty comfortable saying he. 
you know, because that, that seemed to be the choice that he made. Um, but it's complicated. It's, it's complicated attributing gender to dead people in the past. Uh, and I would just sort of, part, part of the work that I want to do as a historian is to say, well, let's just not default to that's what their body was so we know what their pronoun is. It's like, let's look at the whole picture and how they lived. And Parkhurst, I would say, lived a man's life. Um, another interesting thing about him before I move on to the next slide is that um, now that it is a state law in California that both disability history and LGBT history be taught in the K-12 curriculum, Charlie Parkhurst in a discussion of his gender status is part of the fourth grade California history curriculum. So yeah, pretty cool, I think. Um, um, a couple of other quick stories about just the ubiquity, uh, not obscurity of transgender themes in uh, late 19th century uh, California. You know, for those of you who know your California literary history, Bret Hart and Ambrose Bierce are two of the more celebrated, you know, white English language authors in California in the second half of the 19th century. Um, and both of them wrote well-received short stories about what we would now I think call transgender phenomena in um, Gold Rush era California. So Bret Hart's um, story was called The Poet of Sierra Flat. And without getting too down into the weeds about what the story is, there's a fictional Gold Rush town, Sierra Flat. Um, there is the well-beloved um, theatrical entertainer in town. Her name is California Pet. And um, <laughs> she, um, she's very well regarded for the impersonations that she does of white male street urchins in San Francisco. She plays these sort of Dickensian kinds of, you know, characters. Um, and so there's somebody else in town, this young, young guy named, I love the name, Milton Chubbuck. Um, who has become locally famous because his poem was published in the Sierra Flat Record newspaper. Uh, and he's totally crushed out on California Pet and is kind of becoming a little, you know, a bit of a stalker, annoying person following her around. And California Pet says, you know, it's kind of interesting. She, um, she says in the story, um, uh, I wonder whether it was as a boy or a girl that um, uh, I have be I wonder whether it was from a boy or a girl that I have been the recipient of such flattering admiration. So it's like, hmm, this genderqueer person seems to be coming on to me, and I don't know. Um, she does a mean thing which is to invite him to come up on stage with her at one of her performances to recite, her po to recite his poem. And that she's talked to people in the audience and said like, yeah, and like when he comes up on stage, it's like, like throw garbage at him and we're gonna drive him out of town. You know, it's just like, this guy's annoying me. So Milton Chubbuck comes up on stage, is so like smitten with, you know, his nearness to California pet, so nervous that he passes out and that and that California Pet's like trying to revive him and is loosening his coat and she <gasps> notices something that she doesn't tell the audience. They revive him, they go off together and they both disappear. And it turns out a few weeks later that Milton Chubbuck and California Pet have been living as man and wife, presenting themselves as a married couple and Hart leaves it completely undetermined. It's like, wait, so it's like, is it the cross-dressing theatrical performer being the man and dressing as a man who's with this person who's a woman? Or is it like, no wait, Milton Chubbuck is the man who the cross-dressing theatrical impersonator knows has a female body and it's like, man and wife, how, whom, what? It's like, it just doesn't say, you know, and I thought, <laughs> pretty cool for like 1871 or whenever it was written. Um, the other one I won't talk about quite so much, The Haunted Valley by Ambrose Bierce, a similar kind of story where um, uh, the main character is somebody who's like this like virulently anti-Chinese racist white guy who won a Chinese woman in a poker game in San Francisco, brings her up to his general store up in the foothills 
and she works for him basically as a slave. Um, he falls in love with her uh, against all, you know, against all odds. But because of his racism, he doesn't want people to know that it's like she's a woman and that he might be in love with her. So he forces her to dress as a man, right? And so, and then as a man, Ah, ah we, the character, he thinks that she's coming on to one of his co-workers and he murders her in a fit of jealous passion and then buries her and he pines for the rest of his life over this, you know, lost person. But it's like he keeps going, when he's telling the, the narrator of the story what's happened, he keeps shifting back and forth between pronouns and the, the narrator, who's sort of the Ambrose Bierce character, thinks that this racist minor dude is like gay and had been in love with a man who he had accidentally killed. And it's like, oh, and then the story, you know, comes out and it makes it even more complicated. So like all of these like complicated gender feelings are what haunt the haunted valley around Awi's grave. So um, I'll just leave it, leave it at that. Um, all right. There was a law passed against cross-dressing in San Francisco in 1863. Okay, so I mean, if people aren't doing it, they're not going to pass a law against it, right? It's like you're not going to pass a law that says like no private rocket trips to Mars. It's like they just don't do that yet, right? So if you're passing a law against cross-dressing, there must be a lot of cross-dressing going on. Um, and here we go. If any person shall appear in a public place in a state of nudity or in a dress not belonging to his or her sex or in an indecent or lewd dress or shall make any indecent exposure of his or her person or be guilty of any lewd or indecent act or behavior, it sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Or shall exhibit or perform any indecent, immoral or lewd play or other representation, he should be guilty of a misdemeanor and on conviction shall pay a fine not exceeding $500. Um, What's interesting about this is that it's not just San Francisco that's legislating against cross-dressing. It's like all across the United States from the earliest municipal statute that anybody has found, you know, look, looking back using, you know, Google book search, you know, lo looking, you know, after case after case after case, the earliest statute against cross-dressing that has yet been recovered is from St. Louis in 1843. Uh, but like all of these cities across the U.S. from the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, cross anti-cross-dressing legislation. Chicago, um, uh, Toledo, Ohio, Houston, Texas, San Francisco, California. Um, the, the one thing all of these, Denver, Colorado, the one thing these cities seem to have in common uh, is that they were all experiencing a really rapid influx of migrants from many different parts of the world. You know, there wasn't like a coherent, cohesive local culture. It was like suddenly like cities filled with people who were strangers to each other. And that it seems like, uh, you know, whether it was like at the, the head of the overland trail or it was a mining town where miners were coming in or Houston, which was a, uh, a railroad town like for the, the transport of southern cotton. It's like, it's like these big commercial nexus cities that had lots of strangers living together. Suddenly the city authorities decide mm, cross-dressing is a problem. So it's almost as if trans people were going to these cities where they could live a cross-gendered life in relative anonymity and they kept getting outed by people until the authorities decided they needed to make it illegal. But this is another one of those areas that uh, there needs to be a lot more research done. Um, all right, the Bohemian Club, another <laughs> Bay Area institution um, catering to like rich white guys who like go up to the Redwoods once a year to have their big summer encampment and enjoy much frivolity. Um, um, the Bohemian Club started going to up in the um, uh, sort of the North Bay, up in the Redwoods in the 1870s, you know, like they were city people who would like, they would go camping in the summer and like hang out and leave all their wives at home and just have a little boys club for a couple of weeks. Um, and the cross-dressing was rampant. 
you know, and it's like it was pretty common. I mean, I'll talk a little bit more about it in, in just a minute. But you know, theatrical cross-dressing was very common. It wasn't really considered queer. I mean, like read Shakespeare, you know, just like there's theatrical cross-dressing all the hell over the place. Uh, and there's a way that the Bohemian Club cross-dressing kind of comes out of that tradition. But in doing a lot of research on who the people were who were the performers. There were a couple of guys. This person here, Charles Leonard. It's like any time Charles Leonard had a chance to put on a dress. I mean, I swear he was, you know, he was it's like, so is he trans? It's like, I don't know. You know, he was a frequent and enthusiastic cross-dresser uh, who really seemed to love going up to the Redwoods every summer and doing that. Um, 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 so there's a question. 1863, cross-dressing was criminalized in San Francisco, and yet you've got all these rich white guys going up to their like summer party in the Redwoods and doing this. It's like, what's up with that? All right. Um, you might remember that that cross-dressing statute was about public lewdness, right? So there's a difference between ha what happens in the streets and what happens in the sheets, or what happens in the streets and what happens in the redwoods. Um, <laughs> this um, illustration on the left, it's another Bohemian Club illustration. In 1910, this guy Richard Hodling, who's like family owned a big um, liquor uh, distillery and distribution company, um, he was the winner of the Bohemian Club's male beauty contest in 1910. The three judges, or the, the judges for this contest uh, three of them were members of the California State Supreme Court. You know, have judges for judges. And um, the San Francisco Chief of Police. This other image here, Geraldine Portica, um, which is the image that I used as the, on the title slide, uh, is an image from the Jesse Brown Cook scrapbooks held at the Bancroft Library over at Berkeley. And that name, Jesse Cook, doesn't ring a bell. He was the San Francisco chief of police from the late 1880s through the 1930s. And he kept a scrapbook of some of the more interesting cases, you know, just like his little private, private, uh, you know, chief of police um, fetish file. Um, the, the caption on this image of Geraldine Portica, it says, Geraldine Portica, uh, this is not a girl but a boy who was reared by his mother as a girl and has always dressed as a girl and went to school as a girl and has never associated with anyone else but girls and was employed as a chambermaid on 6th Street when arrested. He is a native of Mexico and speaks several languages. His English is with a Spanish accent. He is now waiting to be deported to Mexico by the US government, December 27th, 1917. So these anti-cross-dressing laws are really sort of about the control, the heteronormativization of public space and people who might have those proclivities and can afford to do it behind closed doors or in a rented campground up in the redwoods it's like not a problem but um, the injustice and hypocrisy of it all um, quickly on um, uh, theatrical impersonation um, I'll pick up the pace a little bit here very common this is um, uh, Bothwell Brown uh, was a Danish American very famous theatrical female impersonator in the early 20th century uh, who often uh, co-performed with Kathleen Clifford, um, who would do the you know the breeches roles. Uh, and but uh, Bothwell Brown was uh, raised in San Francisco, was always based in San Francisco. After he retired from the stage, he taught dance you know uh, here in San Francisco. So a, a local person of some renown. Um, uh, by the early 19th century. Um, you're starting to see trans identities and expressions not just being um, uh, legally censured uh, or subject to arrest, uh, but uh, being the site of medical intervention that, that trans people were considered not just to be immoral or to be doing something illegal, but increasingly were considered to have some kind of psychopathological illness or some physical anomaly that made them do what they did. Um, 
There was a famous sexological researcher, Magnus Hirschfeld, who wrote one of the first medical studies of what he called transvestites. Uh, and case number 13 uh, was San Francisco resident Johanna O. Oh, and uh, I include her here as uh, an example of how people just like we're trying to like live their lives. It's like Johanna O. Oh, she's got a great story. I tell it in my book. Um, um, really interesting story, but you know, it was like she li she thought of herself as a woman. She lived as a woman, but as she got older, she thought, eh, "I'm not passing as well as I used to when I was 20 years old, and um, I'm worried about being arrested." And so she would live publicly as a man and privately as a woman. She kept house for um, a group of sex workers, um, and uh, they would go out and make the money, and she would keep the house. And she also sold newspapers. Um, uh, she sold socialist newspapers, as a matter of fact. Um, um, anyway, so th these are images of Johanna O, oh, who like she sent them to Magnus Hirschfeld, you know, thinking, you know, science is good and can explain why I am the way that I am. And um, Hirschfeld included her statements and her photos in his book. Another um, person I want to mention is Jack Garland, who's another trans person who lived here in San Francisco for a long time. Uh, he was uh, the child of the uh, military officer who was the Mexican consul to San Francisco, was given the name at birth of um, um, uh, Elvira Vir Virginia Mugarieta, uh, but as an adult lived first uh, using the name Babe Bean um, uh, in Stockton and worked for the Stockton newspaper. Um, uh, under the name B.B. Beam, um, uh, set sail from Manila during the Spanish-American War and came back with a big American war eagle and flag tattoo and wrote about having um, you know, been in the war uh, and finished out their life in the Tenderloin, um, lived there for decades under the name Jack Garland. Um, and uh, they died in 1936 um, of peritonitis at San Francisco General Hospital because they'd gotten this infection. They did not want uh, their sex to be revealed. They waited a little too long. They got taken to the hospital. They died. They found that they were female. And it's like, ah, the whole backstory comes out. So again, somebody kind of like um, uh, Charlie Parkhurst who had no desire to reveal their trans identity and just wanted to live the gender that they considered themselves to be. Um, by the middle of the 20th century, UCSF has become a really important center nationally for transgender medicine. And I saw Ms. Bob Davis sitting over here, you know, way, right? Who was the uh, founder of the Louise Lawrence Transgender Archive. I just want to mention a little bit about these people. So these are all people who were connected with UCSF. Carl Bowman was the, uh, the director of the Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. Uh, he had a whole career studying homosexuality and other things, related things. He was the principal investigator of what, wait for this act, the California Sex Deviates Research Act of 1950 which is when the state of California said, we're noticing lots of queer people around here after World War II, that seems to be an upsurge. What are the causes and cures of homosexuality? And like big state money, Bowman was the PI, uh, UC was totally involved in this research. They were doing things like, oh, you're a convicted sex criminal, meaning like two men were kissing in public and they got busted and got put in a Tascadero. And if they were sex criminals, they could volunteer to be castrated so that they could, um, you know, look at like, oh, like, let's look at, you know, different levels of hormones and what that does to people's, you know, sex drives. So Bowman was the guy who ran this. Um, and he, in his first report to the state legislature, he says, I have a record of two males, both of whom have asked for complete castration, including amputation of the penis, construction of an artificial vagina, and the administration of female sex hormones. I have also seen two cases of females who have requested a panhysterectomy and the amputation of their breasts together 
with the giving of male sex hormones in the hope that in some way the clitoris might finally develop into a penis. Male homosexuals of this type are called queens and seem to differ markedly from the main group of homosexuals who are more nearly like the average man. Here we have an extremely interesting field for further investigation. We are therefore setting up a careful plan to study a group of these so-called queens. So this is in 1950 where it's like, what something could, you could call it like a eugenic, you know, m medical program, but there are some people going like, you're willing to do castrations and genital surgeries? You know, <laughs> hormone administration, sign me up. You know, and it's just like, I mean, it's just like, um, you know, it's like, is that, you know, a state sanctioned uh, sterilization? Or is that a vasectomy or tubal ligation that you want? You know, it's like the procedure is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and so even though the history of how UCSF got involved in the business of sex change is pretty nasty, uh, there were some people who were going like, I can totally make that work for me. Um, <laughs> one of these people was Louise Lawrence, um, another was Virginia Prince, uh, neither of whom were among the queens, but uh, Louise Lawrence was a Bay Area native who was a lifelong, let's just say, cross-dresser. That was a word that she used about herself. She lived fully as a woman for her adult life. She never had surgery, never took hormones, but she was the person who um, she had a vast correspondence network. She plugged the medical researchers, Bowman, Alfred Kinsey, this guy, Harry Benjamin. She kind of made her contact lists available to medical researchers. And it's really through the Louise Lawrence network that a lot of the early sort of medicalized trans community kind of came, came together. One of the people Louise Lawrence met, she would go and give uh, lunchtime like brown bag lectures to the psychiatrist at the Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. One of the people who was a postdoc there was Virginia Prince, who was a trans woman, uh, still living as a man at that time, uh, who was a, there as a postdoc in pharmacology. She's a, trained as like a pharmacological engineer. She got totally rich, you know, doing like inventing drugs and, uh, used her pharmacological income to support her transgender activism, and that it was, Louise was the first trans person that Virginia ever met. It was like, oh, I'm not alone. And um, she went and um, met Louise. Um, she took the name Virginia Prince because Louise lived over in Berkeley at Virginia Street and Prince Street. And um, um, all right, so anyway, and then Virginia Prince becomes totally, you know, totally central to trans history in the second half of the 20th century. Harry Benjamin was the um, so-called father of transsexualism. He did not practice at UCSF, but he was connected to all of those other doctors there. Um, and he was like the hormone doctor and surgery arranger for a lot of the people in Louise and Virginia's social network. Um, um, Christine Jorgensen is like maybe the most famous mid 20th century transsexual. And if you are a person of a certain age, you know, this, she needs no introduction. And if you are a person younger than a certain age, you might be going like Christine Jorgensen, who? Um, but um, 1952, Jorgensen made headlines as, you know, supposedly the first transsexual in history. And this is not true. I mean, the procedures that you know, the medical procedures she used had been like performed on like maybe like a hundred people before her. There was nothing new about what she was doing. She was just pretty. This is her on the, <laughs> on the right. Um, you know, she looked kind of like a young movie starlet. This is when she's like in, it's from her first trip to Havana, you know, she was a nightclub performer. Um, um, but anyways, like it was Christine Jorgensen who really popularized the notion of transsexuality. It's like she was the poster girl for transness in the mid 20th century. I found a couple of photographs of her in San Francisco at the Japanese Tea Garden and sitting there on Market Street outside the whatever that building is now, like a TD Ameritrade office or something with a funny little you know, funny little round building with a corrugated roof. She was in town for a television news show. Um, all right, so what I'm sort of gonna do here is like, just kind of go decade by decade very quickly over the second half of the 20th century and sort of hit some of like trans history's greatest hits. Um, <laughs> um, so, 50s. Um, 
um, in the 1950s in Jorgensen's day, what was just then coming to be called transsexuality expressed um, a mid 20th century celebration of plasticity. You know, it's like the body is transformable. Ooh, plastics just at this moment are becoming fashionable materials um, for modern design and housing and furniture. Um, we put up this book, Replaceable You, which is all about the use of plastics and medical prosthesis, you know, post World War II. Um, but anyway, transsexuality really kind of exemplified this like mid 20th century modern plastic aesthetic. Uh, part of um, a broader sensibility that undergirds the sense that bodies can be engineered or re-engineered through high-tech medicine, uh, driven in large part by the need to develop new prosthetics to address battlefield trauma and disability in World War II, um, as well as by what historians of science have called the technological sublime. Um, that is that, you know, People felt like when they were thinking about atomic bombs and computers, it's like, wow, science has this newfound power to transform everything, to unlock the mysteries of the universe. And that transsexuality, you know, sort of the seeming ability of science and medicine to turn men into women and vice versa, to take, um, you know, Christine Jorgensen, who was, uh, you know, a World War II, you know, army veteran, and make us. GI look like that, you know, it's like, woo, science. Um, 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 so it seemed power, science had the newfound power to transform everything into something and transsexuality represented this. Um, the idea of transsexuality also provides a kind of example or sort of an avatar of what this cultural theorist named uh, Paul Preciado, Beatriz is now Paul, but that's what it says on the cover of the book. So what Paul Preciado has called the pharmacopornographic era, which is like his just like, you know, fancy name for um, sort of late, late modernity. But what his idea is here is that both like Playboy magazine and the birth control pill emerge at the same historical moment as the transsexual. And that this is kind of emblematic of these new techniques for inciting desire, like, you know, porn and Viagra and whatever. It's about, you know, it's about excitement, uh, but also regulating desire through pharmacology. You know, it's like antidepressants and, or even like psychedelics or, you know, whatever. So it's like you've got the incitement of desire and the regulation of desire through this like whole new class of chemicals. It's like it's a psycho pornographic regime and that the transsexual kind of becomes the figure, the avatar of this current era that we live in. This is the hormonally regulated, you know, enhanced plastic body. It's like the symbol of the times that we live in. And you know, I think there's something, I think there's something to that. Uh, okay, moving on to the 60s. Uh, the feminist anthropologist Gail Rubin, who's a mother San Franciscan, in her 1983 essay, Thinking Sex, had this wonderful phrase about sexual minorities marching out of the pages of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association and into the streets. And this is really what we see happening with trans people in the 1960s. That it's like, yes, pathologized, yes, stigmatized, but it's that, that medicalized, gender dysphoric, transsexual identity becomes people saying like, yeah, I'm that, and it gets politicized and they start agitating as like members of an oppressed minority community for social justice, equality, and freedom. Uh, these are three of the best known uh, three images of the best known trans protests before Stonewall. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Stonewall this year. Um, the 1969 riot that's often credited with launching the gay liberation movement. Um, this image on the top is Cooper Donuts in Los Angeles in 1959, which was a donut shop that happened to be open all night between two popular gay bars in the Skid Row area in Los Angeles. And the cops, you know, would regularly roll up and ask people for their IDs. And eh, if your ID didn't match what you look like, or, eh, they throw you in the back of the patrol car. And this one night, it was just like, nope, not going to do that. And there was a spontaneous uh, liberation of people who had been arrested and were sitting there in the patrol cars. And, you know, it's like gosh, the shape of things to come. Uh, this image on the left, Dewey's um, Diner, uh, Philadelphia, 1964. 
uh, there was a lunch counter sit-in protest, you know, that, that um, Dewey's had started denying service to people that they described as being in non-gender conforming attire. Uh, a lot of these were like young, gender queer and trans people of color. Uh, and they just took a page from the playbook of the you know, NAACP's lunch counter protest. And they basically did a lunch counter protest at Dewey's. Just like, we're not moving, you need to serve us. Um, there was uh, picketing and protesting outside Dewey's. A couple of arrests, a couple of the sit-in people were, pro were um, arrested. Uh, but they were released without being charged, and Dewey's changed its policies, and it was like, oh, you know, pretty cool. And then this one down here, Gene Compton's Corner of Turk and Taylor in San Francisco, which um, won't talk about it too much, maybe we'll talk about it more later, but in August 1966, trans women and gay hustlers and street kids living in the Tenderloin fought back against um, uh, routine police harassment. This was uh, a place that Trans people without a lot of other places to go would congregate late at night, clean, well-lighted place for cheap food that's open 24 hours a day, doesn't serve alcohol, so you don't need an ID to get in, you know, underage people, and the cops would regularly roll through and just, you know, pick people for, away from the tables and um, send them to jail uh, for being, for being uh, or busted for walking while trans. And then one night in uh, August of 66, Things kind of boiled over. I made a film about it. It's called Screaming Queens, the Riot at Compton's Cafeteria. Um, there's the play that Katie mentioned about the Compton's Cafeteria riot. I'm really pleased that this story is becoming better known, um, but I won't spend a lot more time on it tonight. Um, by the 1970s, this amazing wave of trans militancy and street politics from the 1960s came to this very chaotic end. It's like it, it seemed for a while that there was a lot of, you know, feminist, gay, lesbian, trans activism. It was aligned with, you know, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. It was anti-imperialist. It was anti-war. I mean, it was this really radical moment. And by 1973, you know, when the war in Vietnam is largely over, we're starting to see the beginnings of what gets called neoliberalism now. Um, uh, you know, the big state-based, you know, social service programs like the War on Poverty coming to an end. Uh, and things start to fall apart politically in 1973 where trans people suddenly find themselves kind of no longer welcomed in these social justice movements. Uh, the image on the left is from Bay Area trans lesbian Beth Elliott who was a member of the Daughters of Belitis, which was a lesbian organization. She was vice president of the San Francisco chapter of the DOB. They kicked her out. She was one of the co-organizers of the West Coast Lesbian Conference in, um, at UCLA in 1973, which was the largest gathering of lesbians in the US up until that moment. Uh, she was on the organizing committee. She was also a folk singer and a performer. And a bunch of people who now would get called TERFs, trans-exclusive radical feminists. Uh, they organized to have, um, um, to have Beth kicked out of the conference. Um, she was on stage, they disrupted it. They asked people to take a vote. How many people would like Beth to stay? She, two thirds of the people said, no, like let her perform. Like she's you know, part of the group here. But one third was so opposed to it that she hurriedly finished her set and left the conference. And like this is kind of the beginnings of the trans and feminist turf wars. Um, the other image up here is of Sylvia Rivera that same summer. Um, this is Sylvia Rivera speaking at the Christopher Street Liberation Day march and rally in 73, where a very similar thing happened to her that had happened um, to Beth. There's a, we can maybe talk more about it later, but she gave this amazing speech from the stage that's a, a still from. Um, moving on, Lou Sullivan. Um, the 1980s, um, I would call it the decade of transmasculine emergence. You know, like as I've been saying, like up until this point, a lot of the historical record revolves around trans feminine people, and it's in the later 70s and 1980s that the trans men's community really gets organized. This guy, Lou Sullivan, was totally central to that. 
Um, so besides being a trans man and a leader in that community, he also identified as gay and kind of helped bring gay and trans communities together more. He was an amateur historian. Uh, he wrote the biography of Jack Garland, that guy I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, uh, Lou um, uh, became HIV positive really early in the epidemic and did a tremendous amount of work um, on trans people and HIV and doing a lot of HIV and AIDS education. He was also a founding member of the GLBT Historical Society. Um, uh, early 90s, uh, this is the moment when the contemporary trans movement bursts onto the scene. Um, maybe we can talk some about that in a bit, but um, uh, Queer Nation was a really important site, which was started as an anti-AIDS group. Um, uh, became uh, a center of, of trans activism in San Francisco, among many other things. It's what spawned the, um, the first sort of militant transgender organization since the 1960s, this group called Transgender Nation. TNT, the Transsexual News Telegraph, was their, um, uh, their newsletter. Um, and uh, this was the first issue, and I put it up there as like my little vanity Bit. That was me in 1992. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's a couple more slides, but just briefly, it's like what happens in the 20s. It's like you've got the war, you know, the the war going on in the you know in the, in the Middle East. Uh, you've got you know 9/11. You've got you know the, the this huge new wave of surveillance um, happening in the US in the context of that. And that made things really difficult for trans people. You know, like, it's like, imagine being trans and going through the airport screeners like this, and this is what gets seen about your body. So there's a new trans politics that emerges in the context of the uh, early 21st century surveillance state that is in some ways far more intersectional and brings trans issues together with you know, other issues about border control and surveillance and anti-terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, speeding towards my conclusion, um, the Obama years, 2008 to 2016, best of times, worst of times in some ways for trans people. Uh, a lot of progress on civil rights issues, but um, also a tremendous backlash against trans people. And I just have to say, it's like as as um, fond as I was of Obama in many ways, that, um, you know, it's just like, it kind of sticks in my craw that Obama was the first president to say the word transgender while sitting as a the sitting president in office. But where he brings it up is in the context of the war on terror. He says in the uh, 2015 State of the Union address, as Americans, we respect human dignity even when we're threatened, which is why I have prohibited torture and work to make sure our use of technology like drones is properly constrained. It's why we speak out against the deplorable anti-Semitism that has resurfaced in certain parts of the world. It's why we continue to reject offensive stereotypes of Muslims, the vast majority of whom share a commitment to peace. Uh, that's why we defend free speech, advocate for political prisoners, condemn the persecution of women and religious minorities, or people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. We do these things not only because they are right, but because ultimately they make us safer. So it's like the president says transgender to make us safe so we can go drone bomb people in Afghanistan. It's like it's the mobilization of a minority identity for the purpose of waging war against people. It's just like, ugh, you know, and then he, you know, trash talked Genesis. Gutierrez when she wanted to call him out on some of his border policies. Um, I'm just gonna stop here. You know, this is the moment that we are in, in Trump's America, where many uh, of the hard-won um, victories of the past 50 years or more are being steadily eroded um, day by day. Um, uh, and it's not just Trump. I read in the newspaper that the Pope yesterday, you know, issued some statement saying, you know, well, perpetrating ontological violence against trans people, let's just say that, saying that we could not possibly exist. All right, I think I'm over time. I'm just going to stop here, and I'd be happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Susan. So what we're going to do is we have two mics going. Uh, Alyssa has one and Peyton has the other. We're going to start on the side. Just raise your hand and she's going to hand you the mic. And then it's going to go over to this side. So we're going to start on the left and then the right. So let's start. Hi, Susan. Um, over here. Hi. Hi. I took Dr. Argel Thomas transgender studies class this semester. Uh -huh. uh, thank God for the existence of that class. Could you please give us some nuance on Virginia Woolf? I remember in class we talked about how she had done great things, but there's also controversy around Virginia her. Prince. Prince, Virginia thank Prince. you. Virginia Woolf, I did say we Wolf. Do, <laughs> we could do nuance on Virginia Woolf too, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> Or shade Not today, or another day. But yeah, no, Virginia Prince was a hot mess. Um, um, you know, she, um, you know, she, she was, it, I think somebody can be important without you thinking it's like, oh yeah, right on. It's like she did all the right things. Uh, she, um, you know, she did organize a community of people. She helped, you know, raise visibility to an issue. She suffered for her political views. She got busted in 19, was it 61? Early 60s, where she was corresponding with another cross-dresser. You know, there were these pen pal sort of things where it's like she was corresponding with somebody who lived on the East Coast and they were exchanging sex fantasies. Uh, and they didn't know that the federal government was surveilling their mail. Like the federal government was like, oh, dangerous, you know, lavender scare, subversive, homosexuals, whatever, perverts, using the federal mails to conduct this illicit thing, talking about their sex fantasies. Um, so she got busted. She was from a rich family. Her father, you know, but both of her parents were quite wealthy. Um, and she was able to kind of buy her way out of it, get off with probation. Um, but, you know, it's like she's somebody who, uh, you know, got busted for using the mail while trans. You know, it's like, and she, you know, she was a convicted felon, you know, who later had her record expunged. But, uh, you know, she, she suffered for it. Um, she initially, um, it seems like she was thinking of, surgically and hormonally transitioning. Uh, but after Christine Jorgensen hit the scene, she kind of backed away from that. And she was actually quite, um, she, I mean, she took hormones, she changed her name to Virginia Prince, she did electrology, she lived 24 seven as a woman, never had genital surgery. Um, but she was, a, she, it wasn't just like a personal choice, it was like she was opposed to it. It's like, people shouldn't do that. You know, and cross-dressers should not have any contact with gay male drag cultures, and they should not be transsexuals. And so, like, her whole idea was that cross-dressing was a heterosexual male sort of hobby and pastime for bringing out the second self, you know. It was like she, her group was called the Full Personality Expression. Uh, it was like oh, you know, gender does violence to all of us and it divides us up into masculine and feminine, but we have to like reintegrate, you know, like you're in Plato's symposium or something, you know, and become whole people. And so you have to bring out the girl within. And, and so, you know, she wrote a lot about that, but it's like she was homophobic. She was transphobic against transsexual people, um, not a very racially diverse organization. She was very controlling. You know, it's just like, yeah, because she's kind of a hot mess. And she did this work on like getting the state of California to, you know, be able to change your gender markers on driver's licenses. You know, I mean, she did a lot of stuff and she did a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but fascinating person. Yeah. Any questions on this side first? Oh, I got one right over here. Hello, thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, I came from Stockton today, so my ears perked up when you talked mm -hmm. about, I believe it was Jack Garland? Is Jack Garland, um, Babe Bean. Do you, I don't know if you've read much about um, Jack's experience in Stockton, but I was wondering about sort of relatively provincial spaces and how the um, treatment of trans people might have varied or not. 
you know, moving between the larger urban areas and sort of more rural or yeah. agricultural areas. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in Babe Bean's history in Stockton in Lou Sullivan's book, Jack B. Garland from female to male, right? Uh, it reproduces all of the, you know, Jack's newspaper stories and, you know, no local attention uh, to him when he lived in Stockton. So, you know, pr pretty fascinating um, story there. But the, on the bigger question about urban versus rural, one of the things that I find very surprising, uh, and I shouldn't be surprised maybe, is that we sort of have this sense, us being kind of city slickers here, you know, it's like, oh, you come to the city to get away from those like conservative rural places. You know, you come here so you can be who you want to be. And it kind of looks in the, at least through the mid 19th century, um, that tra trans people were known in their small towns. You know, it's like people knew that they were trans, but it sort of wasn't a thing for the most part. Maybe they were thought to be odd or curious or something, but it's like not, you know, persecuted. There's a great story. I can give you the citation for it um, later. You can maybe find it online. Online. It was published in, I believe, 1854 in the Knickerbocker magazine, but then by Anonymous. Uh, but the name of the story was the man who thought he was a woman. And it's set in a small town in upstate New York, and it's somebody who came from a family of eccentrics, and they all thought this person was just a little eccentric. And then they found out that this person who they all thought was a guy was you know, making his own women's clothing and would dress up by himself at night when nobody else was home, and eventually commit suicide. And says, I feel so ashamed that uh, I can't live the way that I think of myself. Um, you know, people don't know me. And it's just like, I'm just so embarrassed to be like this. And, you know, he, in the story, in full feminine attire, hangs himself from the rafters in his bedroom, and his wife finds him. And this is my only request is that I be buried as I am dressed now. And the whole town comes out and sees. Jaffet Colbones dressed as a woman and laid to rest. And you know, it's like that was a story from the 1850s. Um, um, there's another new, newer book um, by um, uh, Emily Skidmore called True Sex um, The Lives of Transgender Men in the Late 19th and Early 20th Centuries. She's done a lot of newspaper research. And uh, because trans masculine lives are relatively underdocumented compared to trans feminine lives, she wanted to focus particularly on trans masculine people. And she found like all of these, you know, like she, she's able to construct kind of life histories of like 20 some odd trans men who were married to women and they lived in their little small towns and some people knew that they were trans and other people didn't. And it's just like, it's this really rich portrait of just a vernacular trans life, not people who wrote biographies or had some big sensational news you know, scandal about them. It's just like tr transness is pretty ubiquitous. Um, and in some ways, it seemed more possible in smaller towns than it did in these big cities. It's like, it's like you t we tend to think Trans people who had to be closeted came to big cities to be themselves. And it's more like I'm beginning to think people who live trans lives in their small towns come to the city for the reasons that people come to the cities for jobs or adventure or whatever. And living the life they were already living becomes subjected to these new mechanisms for the regulation of populations in these very heterogeneous urban spaces. You know, I think it's kind of flipped. Um, so um, yeah, ba basically it's like wherever you go, you find trans people and it's like rural cities, small towns, whatever. Um, um, besides the Skidmore book, another interesting book that's got lots of stories of everyday trans people is Peter Boag. He has a B-O-A-G. He has a book called Redressing America's Frontier Past. Um, and it's just saying like, 
you read the newspapers, it's like trans folks, they're just everywhere. It's like people knew. People knew that there were trans people. It's just it wasn't a thing. So anyway, plenty of sources. There's a question over here. First off, I want to say thank you so much for all the work you've done. I think for me, myself, not having this sort of lineage of trans ancestors to be able to look to and to, have, to discover this and discover it within our own city, it's really um, given a lot more meaning and held a lot more space in my heart for the Tenderloin in a way that when I first moved here was misinterpreted. Uh -huh. And I really appreciate that. Um, I had a realization recently, um, I was speaking with somebody who was kind of a psychedelic elder, and there's the realization that the psychedelic movement and the Summer of Love and Compton's Cafeteria were all kind of happening within this same area mm -hmm. and zone, and I'm really curious about the connection and kind of disconnection of psychedelics and the queer community and queer rights movement. Um. Great question, happy to say a little something about that, but on like tenderloin, psychedelia, et cetera, in the film that I made, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria, with my friend and colleague, Victor Silverman, um, uh, in the part of the film that was about the queer youth group Vanguard and the street actions that they were doing, there was a song that I had in my head. It's like, this is the song that we need for San Francisco, summer of 1966. Um, it was uh, called Roller Coaster by uh, 13th Floor Elevators, which is like my all-time favorite mid-60s psychedelic rock band out of Austin, Texas. What I did not know when I had that song in my head is that they had come to San Francisco that summer because their lead singer, Roki Erickson, used to date Janis Joplin, and she said, oh, you should come out here and, you know, like, let's get it on. And so they were hanging out in the Tenderloin waiting for their show at Fillmore West, and they wrote that song in the Tenderloin in August of 1966, which is when the right was going. I was just like, I knew that was the right song. I didn't know why it was the right song. If not psychedelic, it was maybe psychic, you know, but it's like, <laughs> that was a true story. Um, the, um, the thing that I will say, about, I'll tell, tell one story about one particular person, but as I do more and more research, so much of the early like trans movement, like the people who were like the doctors, you know, the people who were the patients, the people who were the street activists, the people who were the psychotherapists, they were all totally in like the psychedelic new age, new, you know, um, esoteric occult knowledges, you know, they were all doing transpersonal counseling and past life regressions and just like they were totally in the new age and psychedelic scene. Uh, there's a historian who writes a little bit about this, this guy named A.J. Lewis. Um, if you can find stuff by him, um, he's got a great article in this anthology called Trapdoor, um, which is on the cultural politics of trans visibility, this like big, thick phone book of a, of a book, sort of an art book. It's got beautiful illustrations in it, and A.J. has a piece on like trans psychedelia in the mid 60s. It's a great, a great article. But um, one of the slides I actually pulled out, but like, I know it's going to go too long anyway. And if I get started on Reed Erickson, it's like I'm never going to stop. There was this guy named Reed Erickson uh, who was um, incredibly wealthy. He was a trans guy. He, he, um, his family got rich by figuring out how to take lead out of used car batteries and sell it to the petroleum industry as a fuel additive, right? You know, leaded fuel keeps your engine from knocking. Um, you know, and that became the basis of like mining interests and oil and gas leasing. I mean, they just had a shit ton of money, right? Um, they were politically left, his family. The, Erickson's father sold the family yacht to this guy named Fidel Castro, who used that yacht, which is called the Grandma, to launch the revolution, to sail from Veracruz to Cuba to launch the revolution. Um, anyway, so this guy Erickson, who's like bankrolling everybody, it's like he 
sets up the Harry Benjamin Foundation. He like pays for the sex reassignment clinics at the major hospitals. He, you know, just money flowed like oil uh, with this guy. Um, and he was, um, um, you know, what we call a psychonaut. You know, it's like he was very interested in things like, um, well, uh, uh, human dolphin communication or extraterrestrials or ESP and miracles. Uh, he owned a nudist camp and was, you know, was a naturalist and a homeopath and that. And he was one of the people who funded a lot of the really early research on ketamine. Um, he and uh, ketamine was only invented in 1964. Um, and this is like in the 1970s. And, you know, they, ketamine was invented as an anesthesia. Its first use was in, as a battlefield anesthetic in Vietnam, because if you've ever used ketamine, it's very fast acting and there's no hangover and it's like, and then you're gone. It's not, you know, it's like, it doesn't last very long. It totally puts you out and then you come back and you're there. Um, and so it was a great anesthesia where like you didn't want people to be asleep for too long because you're in combat. Um, uh, it wasn't too long after that that people who had had experience with ketamine in Vietnam were like, this is a great party drug. Um, um, and it's like, yeah, you go on these little trips and, and um, read. It's like he funded the research into like, you know, what we would now call like off-label uses of ketamine. There was this medical researcher named John Lilly, who was the same guy who, um, uh, was doing the human dolphin research, dolphin communication research that Erickson was funding. He's the guy who was one of the founders of the Marine Mammal Center up in Marin, which like totally has its roots in interspecies communication research. Uh, John Lilly is also the guy who invented the sensory deprivation float tank uh, because it's like how you have a ketamine trip without using drugs, um, right? Um, and there was Erickson, you know, funding all of it. John Lilly's son was an ethnobotanist who was doing work on traditional uses of psychedelics among, you know, people in the highlands in Mexico and Guatemala. Um, you know, like he was totally, totally, totally into early psychedelics research, you know, before it became criminalized. And after it became criminalized, he was still deeply, deeply involved in it. And actually it kind of, kind of sunk him, you know, that I think he had a very, um, had an addictive personality, let's say. I mean, that he also used a lot of cocaine um, and he used a lot of ketamine. And um, it's not an addictive drug, but I think he just had an addictive personality and he was using massive doses of ketamine late in his life and spent most of it really kind of checked out. Um, uh, and his gated private compound in Mazatlan, Mexico, called the Lovejoy Palace, where he lived with his best friend, a leopard named Henry. So I mean, just totally, <laughs> you kind of can't make this stuff up. I want to, I want to, I want to make a limited TV series for Netflix on on Reed Erickson. It's just like he is, he is like one of the most fascinating people in the mid 20th century. So, but yeah, so I mean, there's there's plenty of psychedelic connections to transness. There's even a story, this guy R.E.L. Masters, um, was a sex researcher, he and Harry Benjamin would um, work with transsexual clients and dose them on LSD to see if their gender identity held while they were tripping. Yeah. So. Okay, I have a question over here. Uh, uh, hi, Susan. Hey. It's Will Roscoe. Hey, hi. Yeah. Yes, my question is, and sort of triggered by, well, the history of the um, institute at UCSF and the relationship of transgender people to the medical profession. And it just triggered a memory of an article by Sandy Stone called The Empire Strikes Back, which is a response to a so book that the, the, had the word empire in it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just advise you to kind of comment on that particular aspect of trans controversies. Um, sure, and for those of you who don't know Will, he, you know, is also a 
a really very knowledgeable person about trans and gay issues and wrote the book on one of the two spirit people, um, uh, Wei Wa, um, uh, who was Zuni. Um, so uh, thank you for coming tonight. And the story about, um, yeah, Will. Um, uh, Sandy Stone, who is another Bay Area person, she lives down in Santa Cruz now, um, been there for quite some time. She wrote, among many other things, she wrote this article in, um, um, it was published in 1991 called The Empire Strikes Back, a Post-Transsexual Manifesto that is kind of a watershed publication that really in many ways launched trans studies as an academic field and marked a really significant shift in the debates around trans and feminism. Um, uh, it's like an early, um, uh, it engaged in a really early moment in trans thinking with Judith Butler's notions of gender performativity. I mean, it's just a, just a really brilliant, remarkable piece. And Sandy had, um, uh, she's like, how old is she? She's in her early 80s now and still just going like gangbusters. Um, uh, so she has this very long history. She had started as a child prodigy working at Bell Labs and helped invent digital telephones. Um, she worked for the Menninger Clinic and was doing research on the neurology of, of hearing. Um, she became a recording engineer um, in New York in the 1960s. She was Jimi Hendrix's sound engineer. I mean, you know, so it's like I hear Hendrix and I think that sounds so trans, you know, it's just like, it's just like, it's a non-binary kind of, not kind of, kind of music. And Sandy was the recording engineer. Um, uh, and, you know, and she w winds up out in the Bay Area and finally gets her PhD in, um, History of Consciousness Studies at UC Santa Cruz and founded the Advanced Computer Technologies Lab at UC Austin and blah, 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 blah. I mean, she's amazing. Uh, she was the person in Janice Raymond's transphobic classic, The Transsexual Empire, uh, who was the target of a boycott. Sandy helped um, Olivia Records which is a lesbian feminist collective, was, you know, really central to the early women's music scene. Sandy taught a lot of the women in the collective how to do sound engineering. Um, but then when Janice Raymond, the transphobic feminist from Boston, finds out that Sandy's working there, she says, oh, Olivia presents itself as a women's only collective, but there's a man who works there and she organizes a national boycott against a lesbian feminist music company because they've hired a trans person. <clears throat> and um, Sandy was, you know, like, they, they, they were all totally cool with Sandy. And they said, oh, we'll, you know, we'll stick by you. And she says, you know what, it's just like, that'll totally destroy your business. And I, I've got options. I'm going to go do something else. You know, namaste. I'm out. And she left on good terms with them. But like, that was like the, one of the first, um, along with Sylvia and Beth Elliott, who we mentioned earlier, is like one of the first big flashpoints in the feminist transphobia, you know, kind of rearing its ugly head. Um, um, the thing about Stanford, uh, she, she had her surgery at Stanford. She's written about it. Stanford was one of the early sex reassignment programs, the earliest ones were like at Johns Hopkins, and then there was Galveston and Minnesota. But Stanford was pretty early by around 1968, uh, and they were very uh, controlling you know, of the people who were there. They wanted to kind of turn out, you know, sort of cookie cutter transsexuals. You know, it's like, if you're not being a normative man or a woman, then why are you like going through like all of this? And, you know, it's like, so a lot of gatekeeping. Um, and, you know, Sandy writes about how trans people basically like, you know, learn to lie. You know, it's like, you learn to lie to tell the story that you need to tell to get what you want, you know, and then you go and live your life. But, you know, just like you gotta like figure out what the service providers want so you can give them that. And, um, you know, what they didn't realize is that all the, I mean, the service providers is that all of the trans people were reading Harry Benjamin's book that was defining what transsexualism was. And then they would go and tell that to the, you know, the doctors and they'd be like, oh, they have transsexualism. And they're like, yeah, they totally, they totally bought it. Um, <laughs> um, 
Um, anyway, it's just like she, she tells a, a, a story about being, a, you know, trying to be a good little trans woman when she's going to Stanford so she can get what she wants. And there was this other trans woman sitting in the lobby smoking a pipe. And she's like, you. And this woman says to her, I am a woman. This is my pipe. Therefore, this is a woman's pipe, and women smoke pipes. And it was like a light bulb going off in Sandy's head, right? It's like, right. Um, you know, and she tells a lot of other, you know, really good stories. Were you thinking of the ringing the turkey's neck story? No, no. All right, all right. Um, um, yeah, I mean, Sandy's kind of shtick in that piece was about like talking truth. You know, it's like, you know, we cannot ever have an authentic politics if we can't tell the story of our lives. You know, it's just like if we're just like parroting back symptoms to get what we want, you know, it's like how, how is that ever going to be the basis of a politics? You know, it's like we have to be, it's like we are, as a people, we are programmed to disappear. You know, it's like trans can't exist. Back to that ontological violence question. It's like you have to like not appear to be trans and then you have to like disappear into the woodwork as a post-transitional trans person, right? It's like transness itself, boom, can't be there, impossibility. Um, and so a lot of what she's writing about is like, no, we have to like own all of our history, you know, all of it, not just the parts that get us what we want from people who have power over us. And she tells a story about like, you know, Trans women are not supposed to enjoy their genitals, yeah, right? And she's like, you know, every trans woman that I know is like the night before she has surgery, there's this ritual called wringing the turkey's neck. I'll just leave it to your imagination to figure out what that's about. But you know, it's like this story about saying like, yeah, like this is my body and I'm gonna do, I have bodily autonomy, I'm gonna do with it what I want and take my pleasures where I can. And I'm gonna, you know, it's like, I don't, it's like I had it, I don't want it. And like, but you know, see you later. And I'm out. <laughs> So anyway, Sandy, Sandy's great. We're going to take two more questions. And then afterwards, it's the book signing, and everyone can mingle and talk. So Peyton's going to take one more on this side, and then we're going to close with Alyssa on the other. Hi, thank you for Hi. coming. Thank you um, for coming. You're welcome. Um, so I was curious about the picture. I wanted to take a picture of the picture of you that was up there but didn't get a chance. Could you tell us a little bit more about the context of that picture and what, you know, more about your bio and, and uh, your story? Well, I won't bore you with too much of the bio, but the picture, um, I was involved in this group called Transgender Nation. Um, um, you know, which a militant, you know, trans, you know, direct action, you know, sort of, group. Um, uh, that particular photo in 1993, I guess that was from 94. So in 1993, there was the March on Washington for lesbian, gay, and bi rights. Not bisexual, you don't want to say sexual, scare the straight people. Uh, <laughs> T can't include that just yet as National March for Lesbian, Gay, and Bi Rights. And um, you know, so I was there, we were actually protesting trans erasure in the parade. It's like, that's what queer people do, right? It's like, you go to the parade and you protest the parade that you're going to, right? <laughs> right? It's like, you hold the demo and you sanction the counter demo and you go and speak, right? So, so there we were. But I was, um, we, were, we were marching. Um, um, yeah, flood of memories is what we'll say. I remember a lot of things happening that weekend. But we were marching down the street in front of the White House. Uh, and I just remembered like, you know, like some of the AIDS protests, you know, from a few years earlier where um, people who had, um, had died in the plague, they, their friends brought their ashes and like dumped their ashes on the White House lawn, you know, in protest for government and attention to the AIDS epidemic. Or I was remembering people um, burning their draft cards during the Vietnam War in front of the White House. And I thought, hey, what can I do as a trans person to protest systemic you know, anti-trans prejudice and violence? And I carried with me at that time, as we were encouraged to do back in the day, a letter from my psychotherapist that I could show to 
a police officer or somebody who might be giving me trouble for some reason, I could say, I've got a letter from my psychotherapist that identifies me as someone who suffers from gender identity disorder and please don't treat me like a common criminal. I have an illness. And I just thought, you know, I think I'm gonna burn that letter in front of the White House. And I did. Yeah. And the woman who was the editor for that magazine, that newsletter, TNT, took a picture of me doing it and wanted to put it on the cover. And then she found out when we got back to San Francisco, remember this is the old days, this is the 20th century, there was something wrong with the film, which is something that you would put in a camera, not a phone, <laughs> right, just wasn't digital, right? Something went wrong with the film and the picture didn't turn out. And she said, ah, oh, crap, she's like, well, would you restage that? So like, I put back on the clothes that I was wearing at the march. <laughs> I took a piece of paper and folded it up. I pulled out a lighter and I, I burned a piece of paper and put it on the cover of TNT, Transsexual News Telegraph. And it said, the caption said, you know, radical transsexual Susan Stryker burns her surgery approval letter. It's like, no, no, if I had a surgery approval letter, it's like, I would not be burning that. This is just <laughs> the one, this is just the one that says, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. So, so anyway, so that's the, that was, that's the story of where that, that picture came from. All right, last question over here. Okay, I could probably do this without the mic, but, um, so I want to bring it up to current. You mentioned the thing about TERFs earlier, uh -huh. which what really impacted a community I'm part of, which is the pagan community, mm -hmm. last year between some TERFs and some radical lesbians that my community are friends with. Mm -hmm. And so we actually formed a group that Beth Elliott is part of uh -huh. on discussing this issue and trying to bring some radical feminists and some gender fluid people together and um, as the next parade is coming up on us I wondered if you had any comments about this problem because it seems a very decisive to the LGBT mm -hmm. community yeah well that's a you know it's a great question and you know I actually have very mixed feelings about it I, I was asked just like last week by a really good friend of mine this is trans guy who came out of a lesbian community and that he has been very um, determined over the last you know decade he's also in the UK where it's like the feminist transphobia question is just off the hook it's like in a way that what goes on in the US pales in comparison and it's like he was saying like I want to do this anthology with this woman Julie Bendel who was like one of the leading transphobes over there and it's like, but we've become friends and we want to do this anthology about, you know, it's like, what do we have in common? And I don't know, I just sort of feel like I'm not there yet, just at a personal level. Um, to me, it feels more like, it's like, no, it's like, I feel like people just be able to walk around inside their skin, you know, however it works for them. It's like, ain't no thing to me what you do. And like, why are you so like up in, you know, my knickers? Um, you know, it's just like, I just don't. You know, just like I don't have a lot of patience with it. I, I actually think, um, you know, well, it's like I'm respectful of other people's political opinions and, you know, you, you know, to each their own and live and let live. Um, you know, I, I do think that there is something that is not rational about, um, feminist transphobia it's like it's not it's not like it's not grounded in like a real danger to someone it's a psychical fear that someone has it's that is um, um, it's like people who feel that they will somehow be undone by the fact that I simply exist in the world you know and just like I like where do you go with that it's like you can't argue with it you can't reason with it you can't talk with it. it's just like you know it's like you just like stay out of my way and I'll stay out of yours. Um, I'll talk about it in public when, you know, it's a contest over public space or access to, you know, social provisions for, you know, social services or whatever, you know, because I don't think trans people take, you know, resources away from other people. It's just like we're just you know, doing what we do. 
um, same as everybody else. So, you know, I have to say I feel very mixed, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, wouldn't it be great if there was no war, but I still feel like I'm being shot at. And so like, I'm not going to say, oh, you know, you who like seem so invested in being hostile and aggressive and dangerous to people like me, it's like, I'll just stay out of your way. But if you're coming for me, I'm not going to say, oh, let's find out how we can cooperate now. You know, it's just like, I'm not there. So maybe we'll get there. You know, and certainly if those, you know, there are people who are willing to do that work, you know, um, more power to you is like, you know, a blessing on your, your activities. Uh, but I just don't know that that's going to be me right now. I think there needs to be a little bit more. It's like, oh, yeah, we were totally wrong about that. Let's process, you know. <laughs> it's like, I'll have that process, but it's just like, I'm not going to say, no, no, I, I, to totally hear you. I totally hear you. I shouldn't exist, but let's have a discussion about, you know, <laughs> how we can coexist in my non-existence. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, that is the last question. Let's give a round to Susan. Yay. Thank you all for coming. There are books at the front desk, and then Susan will sign them right here at this poppy tablecloth table. Um, and you have such a great crowd. You know, introduce each other to each other. See what you're here. Yes, evaluations. Do the evaluations and hand them to the staff at the front desk. And you've got plates and cups underneath your chairs. Recycle them, please.